So, hello everyone, it's uh, 1600 Central European time. Welcome to our Mutars uh, webinars, session one. And uh, so, as we don't have, unfortunately, the possibility to meet at Mallorca in our Mutas workshop, so we are doing these webinars. And uh, we are very happy today to count on um, Jetzt diese Woche? All these um, big faculties. And, uh, I will leave you on the hands of Professor Eduardo Botello, who the will be uh, our today uh, our um, moderator, who is the chief surgeon of the University Catolica of Chile, board member of the ISOLs, president of the Latin American Tumor Society, uh, and also chairman of the CICOT Oncology. Uh, so, thank you very much, Katzen, for your nice introduction. And uh, I want to give you, all of you, all the audience, uh, welcome uh, to this uh, first session uh, of MUTA's webinar. The next one, just to write on your schedule, will be on April the 28th. Uh, I want to thank uh, the four speakers and, and great faculty that, that we will have today. Uh, to talk about this super interesting uh, topic in uh, our practice, that is reconstruction on uh, uh, oncologic pelvic uh, surgeries. And um, I will share my, I want to share with you, give me one second. Um, is it okay? So, so I want to just to, to say a couple of things, a uh, few slides, not to steal the, the information for, for our speakers, just to say that we will talk about uh, these uh, pelvic resections that quite uh, infrequent. And usually uh, the, um, the treatment uh, that we do for this is for resection and reconstruction for primary tumor, metastatic disease, some soft, uh, the pelvic soft tissue tumors, or even is super interesting because there are reconstructive uh, surgeons, not oncologic orthopedic surgeons, uh, that should be involved in this uh, topic because it's part of the aseptic loosening, uh, loosening of the primary hip prosthesis, I mean, aseptic or sometimes for infection. The, the data, the information that we have of uh, the frequency of these is not clear, but uh, Jamal, he, he published that should be about one per million uh, people uh, per year in the United States. Uh, we know that uh, 15 to 20 percent of primary bone tumors uh, uh, occur in the pelvis, and most of them, I mean, are chondrosarcoma, sarcoma, sarcoma the Ewing, uh, or well, uh, also sarcoma as well, but we don't have to forget that we have metastasic disease that is quite frequently at the actual skeleton, and also non-tumor disease of, as I said, aseptic loosening um, or infection in hip replacement will lead to a massive autolysis, like this. In this case, there's a complete. Uh, um, um, destruction of, uh, of the acetabulum with an space that is also broken. And um, of course, we have many surgical treatments and when we have many options it's because there's no magic in the, in, uh, in the results of any of, of these. So uh, I don't want to, to go further. I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Israel Perez, from Hospital Universitario Ramón y Cajal, in Madrid, Spain. He will talk about pelvic tumors, approach and reconstruction methods. So please, Dr. Perez, if you can share your screen with us. I will, give me one second, I will disconnect mine.
So hello everyone. Thanks, uh, Professor Botello, for your kind introduction, and thanks also to Mutas for the kind invitation and all with all these uh, faculty panels. So now let's let's talk about pelvic tumors and uh, its approach and reconstruction methods. So when we face pelvic tumors, everybody knows that oncologically we can do external or internal hemipelvectomy. We're going to focus on the reconstruction after the internal hemipelvectomy. There are some perils that we have to face uh, every time we, we, we do a pelvic tumor. First is the pelvic ring, where the forces uh, and the wet bearing are transmitting, and that we have to know that we interrupt this ring. So interrupted this ring, uh, the patient is going to have a, a loss of function and quality of life. And we have to try to afford, um, afford that in the, in the best way. Also, uh, the pelvis has a complex anatomy full, full of pelvic viscera, vessels, nerves, and we have to deal with this complex anatomy. And also with the tumor localization, it's not the same that the tumor is in the inner part or the outer part of the pelvis, or it's in the lower pelvis or the upper pelvis. It's going to be different uh, anytime. So as everybody knows, uh, these are the pelvic zones described by Anakin and uh, also uh, with Simon with the hip and the, and the sacrum. And after resection, we have to face this, these situations. Um, the pelvic ring stability, as we said, that we have to try to so this instability, uh, there are some kind of reconstructions we, uh, where we don't, we don't deal with it and we just keep the, the ring unstable, but the patient is, gonna, uh, is able to have quite pretty good functional quality of life. There are some other um, lesser issues as limb discrepancy and also deformity, but for many patients, those are major issues, so we have to afford them too just to keep the best function and quality of life and also deal with the surgical and medical complications during the surgery and after the surgery with the post-op post care. So on, in our center, since we started in the 19, uh, 1980s, we perform over 100 um, very big tumors, including be, uh, big benign tumors and also meds. Um, almost, um, more than a half uh, bones are comas, one third uh, soft tissues are comas, most of them high grade. To face this kind of reconstructions, uh, everybody, uh, everybody, as everybody knows, that there's no, if there's no discontinuity, there's no need of reconstruction apart from a mess to avoid the herniation of the abdominal viscera. But all the others are kind of different kind of reconstruction methods that we can uh, use uh, in any case, and it's have, it has to be then done case by case. Also, hip transposition we have to keep it in mind because it, uh, it's a very nice solution as a primary reconstruction, or also uh, when there's uh, some complications, uh, there are some complications as infection. So to start with, uh, we're gonna show you some cases of what this we are um, daily doing, how we plan, how we plan this patient, and how we do with them. This is uh, a zone one um, contrast sarcoma that we treated with atrodesis. It's a patient with a multiple hereditary osteoporosis, and he developed a huge contrast sarcoma that. Uh, reached from the island to the 12th uh, rib on that on, on that side. So we planned the aleostotomy over the supraacetabular area and also the sacroiliac joint. And here we have the situation with the osteotome placed on over the acetabulum. And this is the situation of the patient after their resection. And with the allograph done in place with um, um, <clears throat> fixed with plates and screws. This was done in 2002. This is the, uh, the last x-ray we have of this patient in 2016, but we also have uh, after that uh, CT and MRI and the patient is, do is doing fine. This reconstruction never failed. It keeps the pelvic continuity, and thanks to that, the function of the of the patient is almost to almost normal. But 
Unfortunately, uh, he developed some local recurrences on the on the soft tissues on the outer part at the beginning of the pelvis, on the inner part. Uh, the last year, in grade two, and he developed lung meds, and now he's alive but with disease. This another uh, another uh, reconstruction we've done. This is a type two, one plus four in a 27-year-old patient with a soft alveolar soft tissues are come a primary of bone uh, with a lung med, a solitary lung med. So in the MDT, we decided to treat the, the lung med and uh, um, to administer neoadjuvant radiotherapy as this uh, particular tumor don't, don't have, uh, doesn't have radio, um, chemotherapy, it's not chemosensible. So we treated that and re-staged the patient two months after a radiotherapy to know whether the, uh, the disease was stable or not. He didn't even she didn't develop any other any other med. So we tried to um, um, remove that. We offered the patient to take take the tumor out. So we planned uh, this surgery using the navigation system uh, developed by Medtronic, and also we used the uh, we did the surgery with the uh, neurophysiology control interoperatively, so not to damage uh, nerves that we didn't want to. And here we see the osteotomy on the ilium, and the osteotomy on the second was through the foramina uh, S1, S2, and the transfer of, of S3. As you see here on the left picture, we see the, the tumor still in place with a sciatic nerve in the middle. And this, we plan also this, um, this reconstruction in two stages to avoid the problems with the wound and also the infection. So we put that big cement spacers, as you can see on the X-ray, um, with a screw on the posterior column. Three weeks after, the, and with the margins free, we um, performed a uh, sacropelvic stabilization with uh, screws and bars on the anterior and posterior column and S1 and S2 with cement loaded uh, with antibiotic. And this is the final reconstruction of this curl. And uh, here she is, the, the video is going very slow, but uh, she was able to walk without aid of crutches two months after. And now on the first on the first uh, follow up, she's free of disease. Let's, let's see whether she keeps on. This is our first uh, pelvic uh, allograft, and I think the the first maybe the first pelvic transplantation in Spain, type one plus two plus three because of a dysmoplastic fibroma affecting the whole ilium. Uh, you can see it was done in 1989, and we, here's the piece, the resection piece and the osteoarticular allograft that we put in the patient with this stabilization at the beginning. Um, the patient developed an arthritis that we treated with a THA that, and the patient still remains in place. And this is the last the last array we have uh, from the patient, but the patient was in our in our office uh, two years ago, doing perfectly well, and he, he's gonna be checked at the end of this year. This is another type one, two, and three resection, uh, but this this time done with by a hip transposition. Uh, this is a 50, 57 year old man with a clear cells uh, carcino renal cell carcinoma treated in 2010, and he developed this this mid in the left ileum in 2014. From that, that on, the patient uh, was treated with radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, intralesional uh, surgery plus uh, bone cement plus radiotherapy again. And after that, uh, he developed uh, a med on the right ileum that was treated uh, without having to interrupt the pelvic rim. And one year after no treatment, no, no medical treatment on the patient, the, uh, the left ileum med was growing without any other med in any other part of the body. So we offered the patient to remove the microscopic tumor in this case. So uh, we, we went for it. 
here we have on the on 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 this part this is proximal this is distal this is the leg this is the previous scar um, of a previous surgery and here we have the femoral nerve and the vessels and this is the the item we're gonna take out and this is the situation after the resection here is when we are finishing the the resection with the bone wax on the on the sacrum we sit down the sciatic nerve the tooth of nerve and then the the sternal iliac vessels with the femoral nerve we perform this uh, reconstruction with a hip transposition with a uh, proscriban femur or mega prosthesis to try to treat the limb discrepancy and uh, the deformity of this limb but unfortunately the patient developed a wound, deep wound infection and we, he required to remove all the uh, all the hardware and this is the last uh, follow-up and this sent this on December in December 2020 patient is free of disease uh, he is doing fine the infection the infection was controlled he doesn't have any 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 drainage and uh, he's doing like this with two crutches he's able to drive he goes to physiotherapy and he's recovering because he developed a femoral nerve palsy and also peroneal nerve um, this is another case with a type 2 plus hip extraticular with uh, treated with an allograft composite uh, with the man with a grade 2 chondrosarcoma on the uh, acetabular area with a big soft tissue mass, soft tissue mass that was pushing pushing medium uh, the urethra. So we planned uh, the extraticular osteotomy as you can see here in 1999. Three years after the uh, the allograft was um, consolidated, but he the, uh, the patient developed two local recurrences and it, it pushed us to do an external hemipelvectomy on this patient. The patient remained free of disease till 2016, when we we detected uh, lung meds and he's been he's been um, operated by lung meds so many years after. 2016, 18, and 20, one med each year. And now the patient is alive with disease, but with a close, without disease, but with a close follow-up. This is another case with, uh, with mature on, on, on the zone two. And we can see here a chondrosarcoma and we perform an osteoarticular allograft that was doing fine for eight years. We just use, as you can see here with an MSTS score of 90%. And we also had uh, the S SF12 with um, physical status fair, but uh, bad mental status. And uh, 10 years after the, uh, the reconstruction, the, uh, the allograft failed uh, on the central area. So as we are very keen on osteoarticular allograft, we've done over 45. We tried the second allograft that also failed and after that we planned for a custom made uh, a silver coated mega prosthesis we, uh, that we did in 2018 and it's still in place almost two years follow up uh, well two years follow up and the patient is doing fine this is a six month follow up she was working with two crutches now she was with one crutch and she, she's back to work uh, another case of type 2 plus hip extraticular is a proximal femur osteosarcoma affecting the hip. So it's uh, we perform a proximal femur plus uh, zone 2 on the pelvis. As you can see, reconstructed with a articular allograft, uh, stabilized, stabilized by um, Acutrax and also a proximal, a proximal hip uh, through the compress system. And as you can see here on the CT uh, images, uh, the allograph is fully um, consolidated uh, on, every, on every place. And the patient, this is the last MRI follow-up 2020, patient is doing fine without a slight limp. He finished uh, his degree and now he's working. And to finish with the talk, this last case that we prepared also with a navigation, navigation system. 
Um, is, uh, she's a 42-year-old year girl um, with, a, with a time carcinoma that was treated one year before, and the patient developed uh, solitary metastasis on the pelvis, affecting zone one plus three plus the hip. So we planified this resection, as you are seeing here. Uh, and the neck was affected, and you can see on the bottom left uh, picture. We used the navigation system, and here you can see on the central app picture with the navigated osteotome uh, on the um, pubic bra, bra, um, on the pubic side to do the osteotomy. And here uh, on the right, you can see the osteotomy of the proximal femur uh, in a rectangle shape to avoid that lesion on the, uh, on the neck. So here we have the, the, the femoral neck, the osteotomy on the ileum. This is the, the outer part of the pelvis, and this is the pubic ramus. And this, in this case, we perform a lumis extraction with a cemented uh, stem on the femur. And also we use the Trevier RMS to, with a, a dual mobility cap to, uh, to try to avoid the risk of luxation. In this case also was done with intraoperative neurophysiology con control, which we usually do uh, as other, other colleagues in, our, in Madrid are doing as well, like in the clinic. So in conclusion, we have to face after resection many, many problems, so you can complication. We have to focus also on the function of the and the quality of life of the patient, apart from removing the tumor as well, which is the main important thing that we have to do. And we have also some pearls. Uh, we have to know how is the pelvic ring, the complex anatomy, the localization of the tumor. We This is an extra compartmental area, so most of the time we don't have uh, uh, lay, uh, margin marginal layers, so it's just the cell, the capsule of the tumor, which is gonna separate the the tumor on with the um, from the from the all the viscera and the pelvis. So probably uh, chemo or radiotherapy, ad, the adjuvant the radiotherapy is ha, has to be delivered. Also, we have to keep in mind all the reconstruction options because it, it, this has to be case by case based on the age of the patient, etiology, survival, stage, um, uh, all, these, all, all these situations with inadequate uh, planifications. And we don't have to forget the post-op care, you know, with the treatment antibiotic, with all the catheters that the patient have, taking care of the proteins of the patient, taking care of everything. So we lower the rate of complications. And just to say thank you all again, and thank you for to Implantcast for the kind invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Perez. Can, yeah. Thank you. I will share. If you stop sharing your your screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to now. Thank you very much. Give me one second. One second. So, thank you very much, uh, Doctor Israel Perez. Uh, we have a uh, we saw a nice uh, presentation with different type of reconstructions and uh, nice conclusions as well at the end uh, of your talk. And uh, we don't have any question uh, already, but for sure we will have later on. Uh, so I will ask you, please, if you can stay online till the end, so we can uh, share some uh, experiences and, uh, and uh, we could answer the, the question of uh, our, our audience. Uh, now I, I want to introduce Dr. Georgi Iluditze, uh, he's uh, from the National Prayer of uh, um, Hospital of uh, Russia. And he will talk about the result of lum lumic endoprosthesis in patients with tumor lesion of the acetabulum. Please, uh, Dr. Iluditze, I will, if you share your screen.
dear colleagues, I'm honored to offer you uh, our, our clinical experience of treatment in patients with tumor lesions of the terrestrial region. Uh, recently, various techniques of limb cell wash treatment have been developed and used. All these techniques are characterized by a fairly high risk of development in postoperative complications, among which uh, infectious complications predominate and the related functional results, which makes it impossible to determine from all uh, single universal reconstruction technique. Uh, reconstruction operation have been performed in uh, 40 cases of peristoboral resection with uh, leumic endoprothesis. Most patients had a uh, primary bone tumors, uh, to which patients had soft tissue, some comas, and uh, solitary metastasis of renal cell cancer. Uh, and five patients had been a uh, tumor in period stable. Average was 45 years. Uh, patient with a diagnosis of chondrosarcoma of left iliac and ischium bones uh, performed an in, uh, internal gamepectomy with reconstruction. The stem of uh, the prothesis was uh, installed to the sacroiliac joint. Uh, result from one year after surgery. Operation is in, on the MST scale uh, after year operation in this case was uh, 89 process. After chondrosarcoma of the left iliac and initial bone, uh, Stem of prothesis was installed into the body of L5 uh, through the sacroiliac joint. This video, ah, four months after operation, uh, the patient is in, well, everything, everything is good. Uh, patient with diagnosis chondrosarcoma on right leg bone, seven months after surgery. Um, localized chondrosarcoma right in the bone. Uh, soft tissue component was absent too. On first step was selective embolization of tumor. After lo local resection, Type 2 bionic ink with uh, leumic reconstruction. I'd like to note about the developed bias method of additional fixation of the attachment tube to the endoprothesis by lapsan filament. Patient with diagnosis, uh, with diagnosis of osteosarcoma of the right sciatic bone, condition after courses of chemotherapy. Reconstruction with leumic endoprothesis, seven days mm -hmm. after operation. and six months after operation. Um, it's um, our uh, the, the, the our the greatest experience. Patient in the place of residence was diagnosed with a tumor of the right subiliac and sided bones. Uh, treatment, she turned to a private clinic in Israel. The patient underwent an open biopsy of the tumor. However, access of for a biopsy was carried out through the anterior abdominal wall, which was not appropriate in this situation. Histologically, chondrosarcoma G2, it was proposed to perform crippling treatment. She turned to our department and the patient underwent resection right uh, pubic ileum aesthetic bones with an endoprothesis of the acetabulum and hip joint with a combined excess. Interop uh, operatively, the common ileal artery and vein was interested and stitched in view of the pronounced adhesion process after performing an open biopsy. Result after six months of surgery. The method of implantation stem to the L5 vertebra body through the sacrum was licensed to 
Все, стоп и обратно. Uh, the mean duration of uh, operation was about four hours. The average volume blood of loss was approximately three, three half liters. The functional outcome by MSTS scale averaged 62 proteins. Most operations were radical. The positive resection age was diagnosed in three cases. The average follow-up period was 42 months. Progression of the disease in terms of six to 44, 42 months was relieved in 13 patients, 10 of which died from disease progression, uh, 28 at the time of the study without signs of progression. Uh, number and types of complication are performed on the slide. Um, for example, young lady with chondrosarcoma of left, left ilium in two, uh, 2017 had performed by internal gametectomy with lumic reconstruction. But at eight months after there was a dislocation with the astasis all wound. To so all other got in deep infection, we were forced to perform external gametectomy. Conclusion, Lumic expands the indications for limb treat, saving treatment of patients with tumor lesion of the stabulum. It allows to achieve uh, comparable results and in some cases better functional and oncological results in comparison with the limb salvage surgical techniques. Ilian inguinal femoral access without performing additional incision to the pubic symphysis can be considered like a standard in case of locally advanced tumor, it's possible to use a combined excess. Uh, this manner requires adequate marginal technique support of the clinic. It's characterized by sufficient frequency of post-operative complications and long-term rehabilitation is recorded in the, uh, the post-operative period. Thank you uh, for your attention and we invite everyone in Moscow to share experience in our department. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Georgi Illustre. And uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one um, is... Um, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, Eduardo. Should we have sorry. a discussion after all together? Isn't that better? Or do we go one by one? Okay, I would I would like to do uh, one or two questions, and at the end we can, uh, in order not to to lose the focus on the, this topic, and at the end we will we can share and we can comment. I mean, okay. about uh, okay. So um, so um, we have a question. Does the type uh, the type of surgery depend on the grade of the tumor? All, um, all tumors with the grade G3 or G4 was um, on, on first step was underground the chemotherapy. After that, we make a surgery with post-operative courses of chemotherapy of uh, radiotherapy. Okay, if, uh, if grade was a G2, for example, chondrosarcoma G2, or osteosarcoma G1, we make uh, surgery for first step. After, uh, after when we take a histology uh, conclusion, we make a, another case types of treatment. Okay, last question, and then, and at the end we will have a we can uh, we can share I mean uh, other comments and other and answer other question. One from uh, Dr. Francisco Linares from Colombia. Uh, he's asking, what do you do in loosening cases of lumic? Any advice in order to avoid it? If we lose uh, what? If you have a loosening of uh, any, 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 any tip, any tip when you have uh, a loose... Uh, you can use all... Um, to avoid. If we lose, uh, we uh, we make a surgery. Uh, 
we, we, we made the uh, close reduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So yeah, we will, perfect. We will go on, we will continue with, um, we, we will continue. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, and uh, we will uh, answer the, the, the rest, the other, the other question. I want now to introduce, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor uh, Pietro Ruggeri uh, from the University of Padova. He's a, he's a member of many boards and committees around the world, ISOS, MSOS, CICOT, CIOT. So it's complicated to mention all, uh, uh, all the, his affiliation. And he will talk about the planification of 3D implants and results. Please, please, Professor Ruggeri, can you share your screen with us? Sure. Thank you, Eduardo, for your kind introduction, and thanks for for to Implantcast for having me here. One thing that I would add to the many uh, societies uh, Professor Botello was mentioning for me is even more important. I had the pleasure of having a long time ago as a fellow with me, Eduardo Botello, and now that he's better than me. I'm even more pleased and honored that I have been with me for some time. So now it's time to share my screen. And, uh, and uh, can you see it? Perfect. OK, so I'm going to discuss about planification of 3D implants and results. And um, as you can see here from the on your left, you see a very old custom made prosthesis that was done built in Rizzoli, 1947. Very improbable now if we think about this, but for a case of a tumor in 1947, now 70 years later, you see a prototype of a 3D printed for an osteosarcoma of the pelvis. So you can clearly see how much the improvement impacted on functional limb salvage even for pelvic resection. This is due to surgical techniques, adjuvant treatments, and to biomedical engineering. And as you know, the history of 3D printed reconstruction, and namely for the pelvis, is extremely recent. You see these are, at least for tumors, and in fact, you see these are some of the first papers reported 2011, 2017, 2018. From China, you see my very good friend and past president of ISOS, Wei Guo. And uh, this is a paper that we reported, uh, my team with Professor Angelini Perstotto reported on International Orthopedics in 2019 on 3D dimension printed custom made prosthetic reconstruction from revision surgery to oncologic reconstructions. And as you see, we started our experience basically for pelvic reconstruction in revision surgery for the hip and pelvis. And you see these were some of these patients. Of the 19 patients with pelvic reconstruction, uh, 10 were for tumor cases in this reported experience on international orthopedics. And you see the vast majority of these we did in cooperation with implant cast with the motors and the implant cast prosthesis. And, uh, but I like to point out about planification, which is extremely important. It starts with the, what we call the first step, step of ideation. So where there's a design that is uh, jointly made by the surgeon and the engineer or the engineers. This is a case of revision surgery where indication has directly related directly with extent of osteolytic lesion, absence of structural bone support or discontinuity of the pelvic ring. But as you see here, the ideation in musculoskeletal oncology for 3D printed pelvic prosthesis is related to our indication. As you see, there are cases where we don't want to do any reconstruction of bone or where we can better solve the problem with a coartation or a modular prosthesis combined, as we saw from the previous report, with uh, a standard acetabular cap, or there are higher levels of osteotomies required by the extension of the tumor, where we may really need a custom-made 3D printed prosthesis 
or may need a combination of custom made 3D printed prosthesis with a spinal pelvic stabilization. The point that I like to do is that in the past, in the past decades, we were used to using a lot of bone allograft, but we know that in the pelvis, the rate of infections and complication uh, overall uh, raised up to 30% with major uh, allografts in the pelvis, whereas now we are going through this, let's say, new pathway using the 3D impacts. Quite often when I talk about this, I'm asked about the timing because, of course, we need some time, some time longer than we would like to, for preparing. Uh, so designing and building a 3D printed pelvic implant. And so I try to summarize the different situation. As you can see here, when you have to deal with an osteosarcoma, you may have some time, the time of the new adjuvant chemotherapy, that is uh, something over 12 weeks of time, where if you work with a company very good, like implant cast, then you may solve the problem certainly uh, within this period of time. Uh, or at the same, if you are dealing with a sarcoma of the pelvis, you may have an even longer time before surgery. The problem could be if you're dealing with a chondrosarcoma, it's a high-grade chondrosarcoma, uh, not requiring previous treatment before surgery, I mean. So the timing issue becomes really strict. But uh, actually, this could be shorter because the timing is not all the time of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but only the time for the last restaging to the um, surgery, surgical time. And this is less, this is about six weeks for an osteosarcoma, it could be eight to nine weeks. But to face this, let me tell you that, uh, of course, if more time is needed, we can use we can anticipate some post-operative cycles in case of an osteosarcoma, or we can combine this anticipation of cycles of chemo with uh, radiation therapy in case of a unisarcoma. But there are current or alternative philosophies for chemotherapy in pelvic sarcoma that are largely independent from the need of building a 3D printed prosthesis because uh, with Professor Mercuri, we started first with viewing sarcoma, and then I introduced this also for osteosarcoma to try to give, to ask our medical oncologists to give all chemotherapy courses upfront surgeries in osteosarcoma and upfront surgery combined with radiotherapy in adults for viewing sarcoma or all chemotherapy upfront surgery in children in case of viewing sarcoma. Why this? Because all these uh, reconstruction that we can achieve in the pelvis are uh, uh, bare with uh, a lot of possible complication. And the worst consequence of a complication such as an infection in a pelvic reconstruction could be the delay uh, of the chemotherapy. So this could have a huge impact on prognosis and could even compromise the life of the patient. So we prefer to give, when it's possible, when it's responding well, all the chemotherapy and then to delay surgery to the very end of all the courses of treatment, medical treatment. Because in this case, even if we have a complication, this could only impact locally, but not on survival of the patient. So proven this, well, then the workflow of 3D printed pelvic prosthesis is similar to all other sites. There was quite an experience in the past with uh, uh, maxillofacial reconstruction. So the patient is analyzed and we need a CT scan data acquisition then through the software, the prosthetic design and the tumor model is simulated based on excision and reconstruction. This goes back to influence again the prosthetic design and then the 3D printed uh, prosthesis is built and implanted in the patient. So several steps. It is important to consider some modalities and bias in proper image acquisition. So we don't want to have oblique angles of locators and we want to scan the entire region, including surface structures. And so to do so, we need CT scan that have a slice thickness very thin, like one to two millimeters. 
Once we have these, the image segmentation and post processing is uh, based on uh, uh, creating on a virtual model of the tumor, as you see here, that ends uh, in this uh, following step. So there's a multidisciplinary work on 3D virtual model. The surgeon contributes by transferring to the engineers all the anatomical landmarks that can be reached or need to be observed intraoperatively, then there is action planes for the tumor and the needs, all of the needs relating to achieving tumor removal with adequate margins. So this is an example of osteosarcoma of the pelvis in a female, young female, 12 year old. In this case, you see, this is the type second, third resection. And in this case, due to the age of the patient, we didn't want to use, we couldn't use in our mind, um, a 3D printed prosthesis, but we use the preparation uh, to have the, some jigs, as you see here, and phantom models, so that we can use these jigs to accomplish uh, an appropriate resection, and then to prepare also an allograft in this case, like the removal done. And in this case, we in this case we prefer not an allograft, but an iliofemoral coarctation with trivira cube and fascia lata for closure of the anterior abdominal wall because of the age of the patient, we could possibly delay a solution with a 3D printed later. In this case, you see the coartation with a 30 months follow-up. And this is, oh no, I don't have the patient, but the patient is doing quite well functionally. So main concepts are how to fill the bone defect so we can use a massive allograft or metal implant. Massive allograft for the reason I told you, are decreasing their role, but sometimes we need to use them in children where our metal implant, especially 3D printed, are increasing their role. So this is a unisarcoma of the pelvis in a nine-year-old female, type first, second resection required, preoperative planning. Again, you see the jigs that were designed and built to guide the resection and the resection done and the pelvic reconstructed with the allograft and you see the study interoperative for the reconstruction and then the fixation and then the result and the patient at 13 months follow up and now she's able to walk of course with a little bit of a limp but how to assess the current shape and areas with porous surface structure is another issue you see here this is a case of a custom made 3D printed with implant cast, and you see the plan for the resection of this sarcoma grade two, the result with sacral screws fixation, which is something that we really don't like to relay solely in case of proximal uh, reconstruction, proximal resection, because we are afraid that in young patients, this may not last forever. sarcoma of the pelvis, 13 year old male, type second, third resection, preoperative planning. And this is a solution that we really like, thanks to the generous contribution and ideas from the very good engineers from Implant Cast. This model was designed, custom made with the printed prosthesis muters. You see here, there's a sort of shelf. The, when the level is this, at the iliac bone, we have this sort of shelf, which has a very good fixation. And we know all the exit sizes and length of the screws that we need. And we combine this cell with very securely fixed to the ilium to this uh, um, double mobility uh, system for the hip with uh, very good results. This is a design that we adopted in uh, more many cases, in several cases. And we are very happy when this is the level we are confident that this uh, type of design can give us very good results. Also, it allows a very good contact with the host bone and a combination with the double mobility cap, as I was saying. And especially from implant cast, we can have the EPO structure to allow for a better contact and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, bone growth at the host implant interface and the silver coating that hopefully able to reduce the risk of infection. So another concept, how to obtain a stable fixation at long-term. 
This is a case, Ewing sarcoma left hemipelvis, 53 year old female, tumor wall volume very important, no pulmonary lesions, all the new element treatment given, and all the cycles, as I was telling you in our philosophy, restaging. This is in red what we need to remove. You see quite, quite all, if not really all, enemy pelvis, anterior lateral isometric view, in red what we need to remove and the plan that was made. But in this case, we have to combine and we combine uh, together with the engineers from implant cast with sacral fixation with screws with a sacropelvic stabilization with double bars. As you see here, this is the functional results at 3.5, three and a half, almost year follow up, as you see here. And uh, this is another case of chondrosarcoma of the left hemipelvis in a male, 60 year old. You see the area that we need to remove, the area of the tumor and the plan of the removal. This is a case that we did with another company. As you see here, uh, we combine this with, a, with two bars. So with a spinal pelvic um, stabilization, which is very important in uh, not to old guys and a very proximal resection. This case up to the sacrum and part of the sacrum that was removed. And here you see intraoperatively the check and the reconstruction and the patient that is starting to walk with this. And uh, another concept is how to optimize the soft tissue reattachment and uh, provide a good prosthetic coverage with vascularized tissues. So this is a breast cancer metastasis case in a patient of 49 year old female, type second and proximal femoral resection, only site of breast cancer metastasis remaining. And uh, so we decided since the, the patient was really complaining pain, et cetera, and dysfunction that we could dare to do a pelvic resection, which we don't usually like to do for metastatic lesion. And you see the system design with implant cast in the intraoperative pictures of the reconstruction, custom implant and cementation of tripolar implant. But what I wanted to point out is that sometimes, often we need some help from our plastic surgeon because to provide a very good closure, a very good coverage to the prosthesis is really crucial to achieve a good result. And this is the function at three years follow up. Also in the sacrum, you see we reported together with Andrea Angelini, Piero Picci, and Daniel Valen this book on tumors of the sacrum. And we published several papers on reconstructive techniques and resection. And this is a case of 44 year old male sacral chordoma, proton therapy, then in blood resection of the sacrum and alpha L5 vertebra. And the reconstruction with custom main prosthesis, you see what we call the sort of Batman prosthesis combined with uh, double bars uh, stabilization, first surgical stage, rectal removal, vascular preparation, anterior osteotomy of L5. And uh, you see the osteotomy is guided by a prepared jig. And so it's, uh, it makes easier the resection of L5. As you see here, second stage is final instrumentation that will be combined to the prosthesis that is the phantom that going to substitute what we removed after a plus than total sacral resection. Third surgical stage is colostomy and perfection in hemostasis. And here is the result. And here is the patient 17 months follow up. Of course, he's able to walk on crutches, not so easy, but maybe he prefers to be held by our young 3D residents in this case. And so the advantages of 3D printed pelvic prosthesis. Now, first, the shape and design of prosthesis are based on a thin layer CT scan converted into a 3D digital model. Custom jigs guides for intraoperative resection are safe and let's say cheap. Uh, so they can act, they can work better, even better than navigation or they can even be combined with navigation. A porous surface may favor soft tissue reattachment as I tried to show you and probably to reduce so the mechanical failures at long term. There are potential developments in 3D printed technology 
looking at newer materials. And in fact, uh, implant cast is one of the best in this field because contributing with EPO and silver coating may give really major advantages as it seems to be in our uh, experience. But I want to point out uh, like the very last point that an excellent collaboration between surgeons and engineers is the best way to obtain good results for that particular case, but also to improve the results over the time. There are surgeons in Europe and in the world that are becoming more and more experienced. And one of the most experienced surgeons in the world is my friend, Daniel Kotrick, that is going to lecture now here after me. I like to point out that I've been honored with my group, with my team, uh, to um, um, work on this paper on analysis of principles inspiring design of three-dimensional printed custom-made prosthesis in two referral center with Daniel Kotrick and Andrei Zafransky. And so we were able to analyze 41 patients with 3D printed custom made prosthesis. And I think this was a very good experience for us and was an honor again and a pleasure to work with my friend Daniel. So thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Professor Ruggeri. Wonderful talk as usual. And uh... And now, give me one second, so I will connect mine. I will share my screen with you. And uh, to introduce uh, Professor Daniel Kotrick from uh, Pomeranian Medical University of Sesen, Poland. He will talk about the approach to custom-made reconstructions around pelvis. How to avoid problems? Nice question. So, Professor Kotrick, Thank you. If you can share your screen. Just to make you make sure, can you hear me and see my presentation properly? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Professor, Professor Batali. Thank you very much for your invitation and it's my great pleasure and honor to, to participate at the uh, event. I just uh, want to say that I greet you from the coast, from the Baltic coast, from Szczecin, where I live and work, and uh, would like to continue this important subject on, uh, on 3D printing te technology. Uh, as Professor Botelli has just said, there are different uh, conditions that, that uh, are connected with pelvic defects and uh, the, there was many, uh, many uh, questions about the bone and soft tissue tumors. We have to just remember what disease we have to treat. Of course, primary and metastatic bone tumors, they are completely different diseases. The mesenchymal origin and, and the epithelial origin are, are, are treated in a different way. So we have two kinds of different patients and two kinds of different possibilities to heal and to restore the pelvic defect. Post-traumatic patients, of course, there's a big group of patients with joint degeneration, deformity, or discontinuity of the pelvis after trauma. And I think the huge, huge group of uh, our new patients is complicated THA uh, with aseptic or post-infection history, which we have to treat many times subsequently uh, dealing with great defects. Uh, congenital developmental disorders, these are rare indications, but they also happen, or uh, we have to also consider iatrogenic, uh, iatrogenic uh, problems of our patients. But all those um, uh, conditions, uh, they can result in, for example, tumor recurrence, another infection, loosening of the implant fracture or neighboring bone wear, and as you can see, all these co clinical conditions, they are connected with osteolysis. So what we orthopedic surgeons have to do, we have to do, first of all, in oncology patient, to treat the patient of the tumor and to treat the defect successfully. And if you can see, uh, this patient is, uh, was treated successfully more than six years ago with a very good result and, um, and with... Uh, 
proved or so integration of the 3D implant. Implant is healed with the SPECT CT, uh, SPECT CT test, we, we checked it. And we started our, our series in, in, in stretching with um, type one and four resections. As you can see, uh, even a fast track was possible. So this, this lady in such reconstruction was able to be dismissed from hospital after five days. So this is a really stable construction. And when we uh, make the, uh, the uh, reconstruction anatomically and, and we have a coherent surface of the implant, the healing process will start for sure. Because it, it has been proven uh, more than 40 years ago by Professor Brannemark that the quality of implant determines the tissue reaction and also, also integration uh, in, is the process which will happen there. And the first uh, um, ones who, who developed this idea was the dental surgeons and, and jaw surgeons. And now uh, you can see we, we um, have in stretching more than 40 pelvic reconstructions um, starting in 2009. And I'm really, really grateful uh, of Professor Ruggieri for his collaboration and, and Professor Angelini also and, he, and all the team because we gathered more than, uh, uh, more than that and we were able to publish uh, um, uh, this, uh, this material. And we know that, that uh, these implants with the porous surface with a porous surface resembling the basic unit of bone, it means osteon, will, uh, will have the ability to heal. But of course, um, uh, what is healing ability of our patients is a different way. You can, you can see this patient has a normal uh, total hip arthroplasty, but um, his surgeon didn't pay attention well to, uh, to what the, the quality of bone the patient has. So he started his treatment in January 2019, and he ended like that in, in February 2020. One month later, he, uh, he had uh, the history of uh, periprosthetic loosening, infection, fracture, and uh, the arthroplasty. Uh, so, so you can see a uh, hanging hip, complicated, totally complicated case after one month, incredible. But when we pay attention to this uh, post-operative view, the initial one, you can see this defect, huge defect that was not noticed and the patient was then uh, really, really suffering. And when we took the CT scan of this patient, you could see the defect like this, but uh, thinking of, an, of the reconstruction, uh, uh, in this case, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really use um, a 3D implant. Why? Because you can see the, the, there is no discontinuity of the pelvis. You have an inner uh, ring of the pelvis preserved, and we can still use a lumic prosthesis. You, can, you should uh, remember about that and, and, and we can uh, do reconstruction like this with the restoration, with grafts or part grafts, part cement um, uh, to, 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 to restore bone stock. Of course, uh, uh, we have these patients and we have complications. After 14 days, this space patient had luxation. We make the, made the, the reposition, he luxated again. So there was even a question on the chat. I saw it, what to do? Uh, uh, with loosening, but what to do with uh, uh, recurrent luxation? We, uh, we, in our series, we, uh, we uh, started to, to manage it in, in, a, uh, in a, a way that we implant uh, constraint as a double or insert. In my opinion, it is a way, it's a, it's a good solution because we, we have for this important part time um, stability to heal the wound, to create the scar over the, the implant. We need total stability. And when you have a recurrent relaxation, the next step is infection. So these are possible solutions. I would be really willing to know what all of you would do or what you have made, what you do in your practice. Maybe, maybe there are some better solutions. However, uh, this this patient is doing well, and we uh, we uh, have this uh, view in control X-ray. 
So uh, I would like to present you now some interactive uh, surgery, which we performed a month ago uh, with a patient uh, who had this implant uh, made. Uh, this is a solitary breast cancer metastasis with a fracture. And the patient um, is uh, reasonably young and, and had um, the systemic treatment, no other meds. So we decide, decided to reconstruct the, it in this way. But uh, uh, metastatic patients are really, really difficult. They heal differently than, than primary bone tumor patients, and we know that. So what happened next? We have had these views, uh, huge reconstruction, and we did. You can see the implant didn't heal, didn't uh, fuse with the bone of the patient, and we had aseptic loosening with um, breakage of the screw and the mandibular uh, porous stem. Uh, running uh, across the sacrum. So what to do? Uh, I will show you a little bit of the surgery. What was very interesting, we opened the, the implant and you can see there was not, it was completely covered with soft tissue. It was fused with, uh, we call it fibro integration. We were very happy, but it was really, really difficult to separate. Uh, and, and that was one problem. So maybe this is a disadvantage in a way. Maybe we can cope with that. I will speak about later. But what happened, you'll see the, of the implant. It's near the superior gluteal artery. And you can see uh, that there was, it was not possible to separate with the scissors or uh, it was so much integrated and, and uh, uh, ingrown. So you can see the, the sudden bleeding of superior uh, gluteal artery. And, and uh, the question is what next and how to cope with that. So uh, I will, can tell you, uh, this happened to me twice. Uh, it's no way to separate the vessel. It's, uh, it, it's no point to look for it or uh, try to find it uh, in this huge scar, in this solid scar. You can only go deeper and deeper, damaging the 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 uh, this artery. So so what we what we do we just uh, take vascular uh, stapler and we uh, clamp it uh, a few times and put uh, Santa Cosil on it. So we manage to stop the bleeding. Then you can see a nice tool which is uh, uh, really quite new with uh, this colored mm, marks uh, on, on it. And it's easier when we, uh, when we drill um, for another stem, uh, uh, it is easier to control it. It is very slowly. And, and I can tell you, I did decided to not to remove the, the old stem. I just uh, twisted it a little bit, the implant. I found the place uh, next to it and uh, next to the stem and put another one. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, now the impaction of a new stem, which you can see in the x-ray, and we, it was really hard. What we can count on in our metastatic patients is, is total stability of the implant. No biology is present there. And for this patient who is either, uh, is anyway, uh, not very good prognosis, we can achieve uh, uh, again, the stability. And we asked the company to solve that problem, to be, uh, uh, have the possibility to, to try to remove a porous stem, which is integrated in the bone. So you can, you can see new tools made of implant cuts, which I'm grateful uh, uh, for, and, uh, and the new stem design, which has a tapped inner, inner part, and we, we have a tapped um, uh, impactor and uh, and the tool to remove it. So, so uh, also for, for, for soft uh, tissue coverage, we try to use um, uh, and conduct the incision in a way that uh, will enable us to cover it easily and nicely uh, end to end. Uh, one approach, posterior always, and, uh, and uh, coverage like that uh, with continuous suturing and the knot, and then um, uh, the skin sutures. So uh, if we see such a case, uh, we, we wonder what else could be done better. Of course, 
the company company does its best to uh, uh, to improve mechanical design and and the progress is uh, is getting better and better and, and it's very quick but from uh, our point of view as doctors soft tissue coverage is our task we have to um, make our progress and we have to practice um, to to be not only orthopedic surgeons when we do oncology of the pelvis but we should also practice with pl pl uh, plastic surgeons or um, uh, improve our skills uh, so this is uh, another aspect this is uh, solitary uh, metastasis of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma localized bone disease after systemic therapy uh, what what would you do or if or uh, replacement um, the patient was planned for immunotherapy uh, and he was uh, in a good condition. Uh, so we decided to resect this metastatic lesion and perform this reconstruction. Um, what I would like to say and thank for is the accuracy of plan and this navigation before uh, operation. We don't navigate uh, intraoperatively, we just plan it like this. And whenever you use um, cutting guys, those patient-specific instruments, like Professor Ruggieri has uh, showed, then you can uh, pay attention to crucial aspect as uh, the contact points, uh, and, and it's always, always fits. Uh, when, you, when these guides, they, they fit to the to bone when, on, on, on the place where, where they should be. When they are adjusted in a bad way, they will not be fully uh, placed on on the on the on the on the bone on the pelvis so so we we find it really nice and this patient was also uh, having this implant as you can see there are no flanges on the implant or little ones only uh, the flanges uh, sometimes spoil our uh, our um, our work because they collide with uh, sciatic nerve or um, sacral plexuses, or or um, some other uh, other uh, structures. So we don't uh, use um, much uh, flanges. Uh, you can see uh, two stems, modular stems uh, with a modular bipolar sodium mobility cap. But uh, there is a point of this that uh, the um, planning uh, resembled. Um, also the uh, post-operative and the, the uh, result was excellent but the patient fell down and developed recurrent luxation so so uh, we had a problem and after that case we stopped using the this uh, echo fit 2m um, uh, uh, cap with a metal shell why i can show you the case you can see a metal to metal uh, shell uh, uh, connected with cement with one millimeter layer of cement. You can imagine what was the work of a surgeon to remove it. So we had replaced the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the shell, the insert, and removed the cemented metal uh, shell. That's why we, uh, we started to use um, uh, constraint caps and uh, and uh, polyethylene uh, constraint caps, which completely solved this problem. Uh, no other patient luxated and, and they heal properly. And I recommend this solution for, for huge reconstructions where we have no stability. And this is um, another uh, aspect of, of the treatment. So you can see the huge uh, combined sacropelvic resection uh, with uh, the treatment plan, with new tools, with uh, uh, new drilling guides. So they uh, totally replace navigation. The surgery is quicker and, 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 and the patient is doing better. We all also you, uh, started to use Edwards monitoring system for our patients. It's one of the most modern uh, um, systems uh, which uh, predicts uh, hypovolemic shock and, and uh, many patients are, are, um, uh, are really, really doing better, even in huge reconstructions. So you can see the S2 um, nerve was sutured because it was adjusted to the, to the tumor. 
this new implant is, has also the possibility to, to be connected with spinal instrumentation and it has a hole in, the, in, in its middle part just for the muscle transfers and to enable um, better coverage and to enable osseointegration integration uh, or and fibro integration of soft tissues on the implant. So uh, this is the uh, result, and sometimes uh, the, it's even it's even uh, amazing like this that uh, the, the stability of the patient he finished his um, uh, his systemic treatment uh, more than two years ago, and he's uh, now free of the disease and uh, the implant, even a huge implant, they can heal uh, because uh, because the, of the potential and and this important, important um, uh, uh, initial time after surgery to, re to receive absolute, absolute stability and healing. So in conclusion, uh, how to avoid complications, I concentrated on, on the uh, implants matters. So I would say uh, little or no changes on implants uh, should be um, produced, especially around sacral bone. Uh, the porous stems could be shorter because anyway, they heal very well. And in revision surgery, there is sometimes a really big problem to remove them. Uh, in big sacro pelvic resections, the implant size should be reduced uh, because of uh, common uh, lack of soft tissue and, and the size of the implant, um, uh, the, 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 the lesser the better we can cover it and, and have the proper healing of the soft tissue. And of course, EPOR. EPOR is a very good, um, a very good uh, cover on the implant. It, it is uh, uh, resembling artificial bone, but uh, I believe it should be reduced, especially uh, on the inner ring of the implants. Why? Because, um, uh, uh, because as you could, could see it, uh, it, it sometimes uh, makes um, us problems with the separation of tissues or uh, organs or vessels from, the, from this dangerous, uh, dangerous area of small pelvis. And of course, uh, the uh, um, controversial uh, uh, aspect of uh, constraint at acetabular inserts uh, as prevention, the first four weeks postoperatively, I believe that, um, this solution works very well, and I would be for it. And and we started to to use it uh, in 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 uh, many successful cases. So uh, I'm really greeting all all of you from Szczecin, from Baltic coast, and and thank you once more for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kotrick. Uh, nice talk. And uh, maybe if you can stop your sharing your, your screen. Can you do that? Yes, of course. So just give me. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank Does you it? very much. Can you see me? Um, yes, properly. Yes. So, well, thank you very much for all uh, uh, our speakers. And now we will go on uh, some, uh, some questions. I will, we have uh, many of them, but I will try to summarize. Um, and uh, I would like to go on the Lumix system because nowadays, uh, well, we, we should say ice cream cone cap and the Lumix is, is just one of the implants of, uh, of uh, this type which combine, you know, uh, a, a stem which goes on, on, a, on a column of bone plus the possibility to have a dual mobility. So we can increase the stability of these patients that we know that the dislocation of the prosthesis is one of the biggest problem uh, with, the, with the infections in this kind of uh, surgeries. So I would like to hear you a little bit. I mean, I'm I'm asking the the four faculties now, if you could uh, give us and all the audience some uh, what, what's what's your experience about some topic about the specifically the Lumic this kind of uh, ice cream cone cap with dual mobility. 
So do you think that the use of Trevira mesh uh, could increase the stability? Do you use that? And if you use it, do you use that could increase the infection rate of your surgeries? I can answer uh, if, if um, how it's in stretching, if, 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 if I can be the first. Uh, of course. Uh, of course, when we when we uh, use Lumic, we we always try to use Trevira tube. However, uh, I am always afraid of infection rate, and and it seems to be higher than in uh, patients in whom we didn't use Trevira. Uh, so uh, I now tend to use Lumic when I have uh, the fundum of the acetabulum preserved. It's uh, there are some narrow indications uh, when when we when we have this um, continuity of the inner ring of of the pelvis and and there are patients who uh, after complicated total hip arthroplasty in whom we can do it like in this case which I shown. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Kotek. Professor Rogeri. Yeah, I like to comment on the Lumic because. I have had quite an experience, although now I reduce the use of the Lumic a lot, but I totally agree, as most of the times with my friend, Professor Kotrick, that the best indication for the Lumic or the ice cream comb, whatever type it is, I personally believe that the Lumic is, if not the best, certainly one of the best because of modularity and design, etc. But I think that the best indication is when you can preserve a good bone stock of the sovereign uh, part of the helium. Because in that case, it stays firmly and can also last longer. With two points that I like to make. One is, I absolutely dislike the Lumix. Sometimes they are a need. Sometimes they can be accepted in elderly uh, patients or can be accepted in metastatic patients with not the quite expected, quite long expected survival, but I dislike the, the stems of the lumic when they are implanted within the sacroiliac joint or even farther, because I don't think they can offer a warranty of lasting long. And in fact, most of the problems or disaster or problematic revision that we need to face are in these cases. Where there were two European studies, one promoted by EMSOS and both of them coordinated by uh, Sander Dijkstra, that they showed uh, not very good results at the mid to long term follow up for the ice cream cones and the loom. The second consideration, on the other hand, is that the best uh, indication for the lumic, that is the same that Professor Kotrick described, is also the, a very good indication, if you can spare a lot of muscles, for a coartation. There's been a long time a debate uh, that was interpreted from a MSDS debate, very famous, where Professor Frank Sim, my mentor, was opposed to Professor uh, Jeffrey Eckhart. And uh, the last one was uh, sustaining the importance and the good functional results with the coartation. And the first one was uh, su suggesting the need for a reconstruction. So reconstruction or no reconstruction. And actually, if the patient is young, if you have a good bone stock, subrecetabular, if you can spare muscles, then this is the best indication for a coartation where you can achieve excellent results without any implant, so reducing a lot all of the risk of complication. On the other hand, this is the optimal patient where we can use a Lumic and can do a reconstruction and can uh, opt, uh, can prefer a reconstruction with very good muscles and a young patient and a good boss talk. To complicate the issue of a decision-making process, uh, when we come to the 3D printed designs, the one that I showed you that was obtained by the collaboration with implant cast engineers, the one that has a shell and a posterior part like an angle, like a, like a 90 degrees angle with a shelf and a support posterior to the iliac 
and uh, screws and a combined uh, uh, dual mobility that is inspired to the dual mobility of the Lumic, that is uh, maybe the more better relying, the best functionally uh, warranting uh, reconstruction with a 3D printed. So when you can spare, going back to what Daniel was saying, when you can spare a good bustop sobra acetabular, then it's the best indication of the Lumic, but it's also the easiest 3D printed reconstruction reliable over the time. I could also obtain a satisfactory function with a coartation. When you go farther, proximally, there's a line where you can still use with fair result the Lumic, but if you pass that line and reach the sacroiliac joint level and you have a very thin iliac bone, and then you have to cross the sacroiliac joint, then I absolutely dislike to use a Lumic. Then the questions that the Israel was asked, no, I'm sorry, Georgie was asked about the vision is quite a difficult issue. We saw how bright uh, Daniel was in facing the issue of reconstruction in similar situation where you can uh, leave the stem and use another stem, et cetera, not to uh, remove a lot of bone, et cetera. But this revision is really difficult. And when you cross a certain line, I'm going to close my long <laughs> reply. If you go across a certain line proximally, then I do believe that this is a young patient and it is not a metastatic patient with a poor expectation of length of life. Then I feel that it is much better to combine a spinal pelvic uh, stabilization with a 3D printed implant. Sorry if I took so long and thank you for your patience. Thank you, thank you very much for a, a nice explanation of uh, this concept. And uh, well, you answered many questions that I had about uh, this uh, Lumix system, because also we saw that, I guess, despite you say that you don't like too much the ice cream cone, ice cream cone cup in some situations when you have a proximal resection, uh, I fully agree, but um, a couple of questions about that. What's the minimum bone length of the column of bone without touching the sacroiliac joints that you would like to have for an ice cream cone cup? One question for the whole, for the whole group. And second, do you prefer cemented or uncemented stems for the ice cream cone cups? Um, okay. Um, the the minimum length uh, we would like to do we would like to have it eight centimeters. So as they said, you have a minimum of left ilium where the implant can 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 achieve their that in a, its attachment. Okay, and cemented or uncemented depends on the etiology or if we are gonna if they're gonna get under chemo or radiotherapy we go under uh, cemented if they they aren't we go uncemented okay perfect Professor. i have a little bit different view because i feel that in many instances cementation is not satisfactory in a helium because the cortices is very thin and so unless you have, again, a very good pedestal within a very thick subversetabular bone stock, in all the other instances, I always try to use uncemented. The only times where I had to cement was because uh, I had some troubles and so I had a crack or some problems and uh, I, or I uh, enlarged too much the, the, the place. So I was forced to cement, otherwise I never liked cementation and the minimum length I agree basically with Israel but I would also point out that is a, there's a lot of there's a big difference between a very thin and small ileum in a small uh, young woman for instance or if it is a, a strong man with a very good and, and, and big ileum with uh, a much better place for the stem. And uh, in this case, not only the length, but also the placement, correct placement 
understand and the orientation and the reliability of the iliac bone cortices do play a major role with this. Of course, of course Professor Ruggieri, uh, I, I meant the cementation when you don't have a, you know, an sclerotic bone. You have in, a, enough quality of bone to, to, to put in a, a cemented one. In no, no, those I cases agree. of... Uh, Basically, yeah, you it, said the same thing, but my concern yeah. is that if you do the cementation, you're adding further possible troubles in the future requiring revision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Perfect. And, and uh, the last question uh, about the, the, eye, the, the eye screen cone cap. Any tip uh, to, uh, to put the, the guide of the for the stem, I mean, where you will put your stem, a any tip or trick? Daniel? Uh, okay, I had the breakage of, of the net, but um, uh, can I ask, uh, was I allowed to answer or? You I did hear. Yes, um, uh, one important matter uh, and the tip is that uh, um, there are many uh, patients which I, uh, who I saw operated in th P3 resections by Lumic or the ice cone caps. And, and I, I think uh, in, in, in my center, we concentrate only on P2 resections. Narrow periacetabular resection is a perfect indication for Lumic or any other sort of this uh, kind of implant. Uh, there's another important aspect we have to pay attention on what amount of defect we, uh, we, um, we produce while resecting the tumor. Because when we implant uh, the uh, prosthesis like Lumic, we have a big amount of dead space around this prosthesis. So you, you probably noticed that, that we, while covering coverage the, the, the implant, we have a big hematoma, we have a, a huge amount of blood. We have a high uh, risk of complications, uh, much higher than in anatomical reconstructions. So I would, I would say uh, the ideal uh, uh, indication is P2 uh, resection uh, for, for this kind of prosthesis. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to, to go further. I, I would like to share with you one uh, one case to know the the opinion of uh, our audience and this is a young man he is 17 years old he has a uh, he have had pain uh, left hip pain for six months he arrived with that with that uh, x-ray with a little relation in uh, some tube and uh, the trucked biopsy uh, showed an osteosarcoma. He received the pre-op, uh, I mean, uh, chemotherapy as usual. Oops, sorry. And uh, wait. this is the MRI, uh, sequence T1, a coral one, and uh, an actual in T2. So, which would be your surgical reconstruction approach to this case? And uh, please, if you can vote, all the audience, and then we will ask to our panelists, I mean, uh, their comments, and we will finish with this, uh, our session uh, of uh, our webinar. So we will see the results. So most of them, they uh, they would choose uh, chose a, a 3G implant. Um, um, fifty five percent, twenty percent an ice cream cone cap, and eighteen percent an allosteosis. Would you be so kind, uh, all of you, of uh, uh, my my friends uh, and speakers 
what's your opinion about uh, about this case and what did you what would you do can you please this? call us one by one so that we can yeah. have an order? please please uh my turn please start oh yeah yeah i, I will go for a uh, allograph composite in in, the, in this case because of the age of the patient and uh, the experience that we have in our group from my professors and mentors okay okay are you not afraid about the uh, the rate of infection or, or um, the of the allograft? Yeah, I'm afraid of that, of course, because uh, allografts have high rate complications. But they are the rate of complications. Uh, you know, I think that in the pelvis is similar in all kind of reconstructions, very similar. Uh, there's a percentage on the right, a percentage on the left. Uh, the overall percentage of complications is very, very, very similar to all of them. I, I, I wouldn't say which, which is the best, which is the best for this for this case, but I would do the allograft composite. Okay, Jordi. I think that uh, in this case, uh, uh, lumic and the prothesis is more adequately because uh, our uh, Prothesis is more uh, complications uh, also in uh, infections. In Lumic, more faster rehabilitation. And in, I think so. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ruggeri. Well, um, I must say, I agree with the vote that we received from the, with the vote that we received from the audience. Uh, my option would be in favor of the 3D printed reconstruction, but with a point. For the same reason why I would prefer that to a Lumi, which is at that level, we have to have a margin. So we cannot stay close to the tumor. It's an osteosarcoma. We have to take at least, if not more, one centimeter from the above of the lesion. So there, the iliac bone is very thin. I think can easily crack if we introduce a stem cone or not fix it very well. So I think I would prefer it to be printed. But since this is a proximal osteotomy, I would join these to a spinal pelvic stabilization. The other point is I don't fully agree with Israel because all the data in the literature do not actually show the same incidence of complication. Maybe now we need some more years for the 3D printer, but we have quite an experience at Rizzoli with allograft, and uh, allograft really have a higher rate, as Professor Botello was pointing out, a complication, namely infection, when compared to 3D printed. But not only that, in all our 3D printed, there are not so many, but we never had to remove up to now an implant for infection, because even when an infection started to develop, if you face that promptly, then thanks to the nano surfaces probably, or to the silver, or I don't know what, uh, you can still, in most of the cases, also in the literature reported, you can uh, save, you can spare the implant. This is absolutely not the case with an anograph. When an anograph is infected, you if you don't remove that, the infection will stay and will never be cured. Thank you. And to finish with uh, with, uh, with Professor Kotrick. Okay, I, I totally agree with Professor Ruggieri and I would like to point out another aspect. Uh, we have to uh, we have to remember that uh, our patient with osteosarcoma will will continue with complementary chemotherapy. And our healing should not last longer than three weeks because exactly three weeks, 21 days, is the border where prognosis uh, uh, before you start chemotherapy protocol uh, uh, is, is uh, really uh, worse. So our patients after surgery should heal uh, quickly. And, and I believe uh, allograft, uh, we also use allografts, but allograft in, in osteosarcoma patients. 
which is a plant for chemotherapy, is not a good solution, not from orthopedic point of view, but from oncologic point of view and what patient will have uh, in the future. So I would go for 3D uh, anatomic reconstruction and, and quick healing for further treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're, we are on time. I really I appreciate uh, your time and then, uh, nice talks. Uh, also the audience, the, we had a wonderful audience as well. And uh, well, save the date for the next session that will be the, on April 28th. So thank you very much. I don't know, Carsten, if you have uh, something else to say or we'll finish. Yeah, just want to thank you everyone. I hope everyone enjoy. Thank you for the uh, perfect presentations and really incredible, nice uh, discussion. And well, hope to see you again, as we said, on the 28th of April for our second session of our Mutars webinars. And stay safe. Aston, let me say one more word. Okay. I'd like to thank and say hello to all of you particularly to Professor Botello. I wish to thank him, Plancas, and since I know, I received the message that Jen Sass, the big boss, is online. I'd like to thank him, not <laughs> only for organizing the webinars, but also for providing us excellent assistance and implants whenever we need that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank also, you. Karsten, thank you for preparation and for, the, for, for your invitation also. Everyone here from me. Thank you, Karsten. Hope to see you soon in person. Thank you, Carsten. Thank Bye. you, friend. Be safe. Thank you all. Bye. All the best Bye. to you all over the world. <laughs>